edge of the cell boundary is actually minus 65 dBm. So it's even a tighter requirement and the cell coverage would even be a little bit smaller. So when you're looking at your devices, you should look at what is the required receiver strength in order to be able to decode and demodulate your signal. And that's what you should be using for defining your cell edge boundary. Now, if you've got greater overlapping coverage and your cell's smaller because now your minimum signal strength on the edge is minus 67 dBm, then your access points are going to be a lot closer together and you're going to have to deploy more access points than if you were doing a data-only network. Now, because your access points are closer together, you've got to worry about the co-channel interference again, i.e. interference between two access points that are on the same channel. So Cisco recommends that the distance from one access point to the edge of the cell of a second access point that is on the same channel should be less than minus 86 dBm. So I want to make sure that you're clear on these figures. So I've blown up this picture for you a little bit. So again, if you're doing a voice over wireless LAN network, the distance between the access point and the edge of the cell boundary is determined by the received signal strength. And on the edge of the cell, you want your received signal strength to be minus 67 dBm or better. Now regarding the separation between two access points that are operating on the same frequency, you want to make sure the distance from one access point to the cell boundary of the second access point is minus 86 dBm or lower. Sometimes you'll hear the term isolation between two access points on the same channel being 19 dBm. You can see here that the 19 dBm is a measure of the power level between the edges of two access points that are operating on the same channel. So another thing you have to worry about when you're doing voice over wireless LANs is that the IP phones run on a battery and the manufacturers want to conserve that battery and make sure that that phone is capable of lasting all day. There'd be nothing worse than if you had to keep running back during the business day to charge your phone. And so they conserve the power level. And most IP phones, including the Cisco IP phones, will transmit at 40 milliwatts or less. So one of the things you need to do is to balance the communication between the IP phone and the access point and the access point and the IP phone. So if the IP phone is transmitting at 40 milliwatts, you want to balance the access point to also transmit at 40 milliwatts. What you don't want to have is a situation is when the access point is transmitting at higher power level so the phone can hear it, but the phone can't be heard by the access point because the power level of the phone is much lower. So you want to balance the two. So in a deployment, when you're deploying IP phones, you want to look at the power level, and then you want to adjust your access point to be equivalent to the same power level as your device. So the last thing you want to think about when you're deploying your voice over wireless LAN is the number of voice calls that can be made within one access point. So the capacity of the access point to support voice calls. And if you're deploying a GN access point, then you'd expect to see about 14 simultaneous calls being possible in the 2.4 gigahertz band. If you're deploying an 802.11an radio up in the 5 gigahertz band, again, because there's less devices operating up there and less noise in the band, you can expect perhaps to get 20 calls in a 20 megahertz channel. Now, these are things that you really have to test out in your RF environment because this is assuming that there's no other competition for the traffic and that these are the highest priority calls. If you're running video calls at the same time, then your number of voice calls would be less.
Also, it does depend, as everything does, on your RF conditions. And if you've got a more difficult RF environment, then your voice calls could be less. So the next survey model we want to look at is the location aware wireless LAN. And Cisco used a technology they refer to as RF fingerprinting, which collects information from devices such as RFID tags and rogue devices like rogue access points and rogue clients. It takes that information that it receives from multiple access points and then analyzes that on a network-based server referred to as an appliance. So it's really important in order to determine the location of these RFID tags or rogue devices to be able to hear that signal from multiple locations. Now to get the location of these devices, Cisco defined that it must be heard by at least three different access points and it must be heard on each of those three different access points with a minimum received signal strength of minus 75 dBm. And each of those three access points must be located, physically located, in three of the four quadrants that surround that device. And they must be within 70 feet of that device. So that's the minimum requirement to find the location of a device. Now, if it can hear four access points, then you're going to get a greater degree of accuracy. Now, note down here at the bottom of the slide, these minimum requirements are actually for an indoor environment, maximum antenna height of 20 feet. In fact, location services really don't work very well if your antenna goes above 20 feet. So if you've got an environment, such as a factory environment, that's got very high ceilings, well above 20 feet, what you might want to consider doing is actually dropping down your access points on some sort of structure such that they are at 20 feet or below in order to make sure of the accuracy of your location searching. So when you look at a location aware wireless LAN, is typically deployed with other applications such as voice and data. Now you saw earlier that the voice requirements in terms of the received signal strength are actually more stringent than what you see on the location aware network. So if you've already planned for voice, planning for location can be a supplemental to that. What you'll notice though from this diagram is that the one thing you don't want to do with a location thing is have your access points cluttered into the middle in order to make sure that at each location that a device might be at it can be heard by at least three access points what that means is you need to deploy your access point in the perimeters of the building and so that would require an access point in every corner and also along the walls Quite often, if you go into a site that's already deployed wireless LAN, by adding access points around the perimeter, you can then enable it as a location-aware deployment. So the only time I've ever run into an issue where I am wanting to take an existing network and expand it to be a location-aware is when the access points have been deployed straight down the middle of a building or a corridor or a floor and what happens then is that if they're deployed in a straight line then clearly you can't see three or potentially four access points for any one place and so in that case I've actually had to move the access points move them over to the perimeters and to the corner of the wall but typically when you go into a site that's already deployed and you want to make it location aware you just need to deploy access points around the perimeter so one of the other things to be aware of when you're deploying location aware access points is look out for any major obstructions. I've had a couple of times where I've been deploying in a building that's got huge pillars and the pillars can actually block certain signals and so it's not possible that that device can be heard by three or more access points. So be careful where you place your access point 
if there are obstacles that could prevent the device being heard. So the last survey model we want to talk about is when we use our access points to form a bridge or a mesh network. Now these networks may be deployed outdoors or indoors. In this illustration, it shows an outdoor deployment and you see two types of access points being defined, the root access point and the mesh access point. The root access point is the one that has the wired connection, whereas the mesh access point doesn't. So traffic from the mesh access point that needs to go to the wired network must go through the root access point. Now typically when we use the access points as a bridge connection we typically use the 5 gigahertz band. You don't have to use the 5 gigahertz band but that's typically where you see the deployments being. Now when you're deploying mesh networks Cisco recommends that you don't have more than 20 mesh access points per root access point. Also recommends that you don't have more than three or four hops if you're deploying a non-voice mesh network. So what I mean for a hop is from the root access point to the mesh access point would be one hop. From that mesh access point to another mesh access point would be a second hop in keep going. And then just as an FYI, the protocol that's used for communication between the mesh access points is a Cisco proprietary protocol called the Adaptive Wireless Path Protocol. So it's very common when you're deploying a dual mode access point to use the 5 gigahertz radio to do the bridge connections, if you like, the backhaul, the connectivity between the different access points, and then use the 2.4 gigahertz radio to provide connectivity to the clients. So for example, if I have a laptop I would connect to the access point using the 2.4 gigahertz radio and then that traffic would go hop by hop across the mesh network on the 5 gigahertz band until it reached the root access point in which case then it would go on the wired network. So be aware if you're using the 2.4 gigahertz radio to provide client coverage and the 5 gigahertz radio to do the bridge links between access points, then you have to plan those out quite differently. The radio is different. The purpose of the radio is different. The antennas could be different. Typically, if you're doing coverage for clients on the 2.4, you might use an Omni antenna. Whereas if you're doing bridge links between access points on the 5 gigahertz band, you typically use a directional antenna. What those differences mean is that you need to do two plans one for your customer coverage on the 2.4 and one for your bridge links on the 5 gigahertz band. Now, I know in the previous slides I was showing pictures of an outdoor mesh, but meshes are very common.